Ladies and gentlemen, welcome down to the International Women's Day Show at the House of Comedy. Please make some noise for your host, Janet Aniston! Hello everyone, how are you doing? Well thank you all so much for coming out tonight. I was a little worried at first, it was like nobody was here and I said, well we could have done this in my living room if I know you. But now you've kind of spread out so you got lots of good laughs in the center area so that's fantastic. So. I'm very excited about this show. I know there's tons of shows going on. I will tell you that the last um, International Women's Day show I did was 2020. Does it ring a bell? I was at the Surrey Casino. It was me and four dudes. Because that's how Surrey does International Women's Day. So I think it's important that we, uh, as women, support each other. Um, that's why we're all here tonight. We've got a fabulous show for you. We've got some singers, some storytellers, all of these people I've met through different parts of my life. And I'm so excited to have them on the show. And with no further ado, I'm going to get the show started. So I'm going to bring up your first performer for the evening. i got to check out her little bio here because they all sent me bios. <laughs> so I'm going to welcome to the stage Devin Moore. Moore. She's a singer, songwriter, a storyteller, a multi-instrumentalist, and her album, Sky is Falling, is streaming now, and she's got a little booth at the back with some of her merchandise and everything that you can check out as we go through the show or at the end of the show when she can chat and explain a little more to you about her stuff. But give her a very, very warm welcome. Give it up for Devin Moore. <laughs> make this appropriate for an instrumentalist. Woo. Yeah, hi, my name is Devin Moore, and I am a recovering vegan. <laughs> it's still the first thing I tell people about myself. Weird, it's a disease, I had to do it. I, uh, I've lived in Vancouver for over 10 years now, and it's like a, a bylaw. <laughs> you want to stick around, you got to either go vegan for a stretch, or like commit to doing the gross grind like three or four times a week, or actually be able to afford real estate. <laughs> so obviously I went with vegan. <laughs> then COVID happened, I got a job in development for a little stretch, so I just went back on the bacon. <laughs> now, I am also a musician, in case you couldn't tell by the hair. <laughs> I just put out this album, it's true, Sky is Falling. It came out on February 29th. Woo! Yeah, big day. And I will tell you one thing about making this album, it really made me miss being vegan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hear me out. Uh, it's expensive to make an album. And so is animal-based protein. <laughs> I really miss being vegan. Living in Vancouver, being vegan, it's like the best way to be poor, but feel privileged. <laughs> <laughs> Highly recommend. And accessible, you know, like beans, lentils, tofu, these are inexpensive food products. Anyone can afford to be vegan. I just couldn't afford to be so tired all the time anymore. <laughs> Look, I don't want to be up here doing starving artist jokes, okay? I do, I really do want you to buy my merch, so I am going to. I, um, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a busy little stretch. I just turned 40 years old recently. Twice. Uh, I turned 40 on my 39th because I was, like, feeling some resistance about it and thought, let's just get it over with. Uh, and then by the time my actual 40th rolled around a whole year later, it was like, oh. I'm like, I'm still only 40, it's crazy. Uh, would you like to hear the sound of my biological clock ticking? <laughs> no, yeah, no, I don't, I don't have one. <laughs> 
something, you know, they'd get like wound up and then you just start ticking, but it never did. And so I, I don't have a biological clock. This is my cross to bear, you know? So what I'm doing in my 40s, I'm just accepting my limitations. You know? I don't have a biological clock. I need bacon <laughs> in my life. Butter. Right? What a product. <laughs> and yeah, this is me. I'm 40. I don't have kids. I don't want kids. I'm just accepting my limitations. I rate my lifestyle 10 out of 10. Highly recommend. <laughs> so, accept your limitations and roll with them. There is uh, no need to try and do everything or anything. I used to think I wanted to, and now um, I just don't want to. Uh, I'm doing something slightly revolutionary, though, as I uh, transition into my 40s. I am enjoying aging. Yeah. Some people are afraid of it. I don't know why. I think maybe they just didn't come close enough to dying in their 20s. <laughs> and then you hit 30 and you start worrying about getting older. I'm like, you should have been closer to death. <laughs> I hit 40 and was like, dang. No one saw this coming. No. But really, life is too short to um, do anything other than fall madly in love with your own collection of cells and frequencies and uh, this miraculous body machine that transports us through our lives. And I'm in a pretty good place on that love-hate relationship spectrum with my own body right now, but it wasn't always the case. And I've been playing this song a long time. I think it helped. Maybe it will help you if you want to love your body a little bit extra. My body is a temple My body is a slave My body is a prison And my body is a wave Hey! My body is a fishbowl My body is a stage my body is an ocean and my body is my rage my body is my flesh my bones my blood my skin my body is this body is this body is where i live that's all it is hey my body is my future Mm -hmm. My body, it's so fashionably cold But this body's not for sale, oh no This body will not be bought or sold My body is my flesh My bones, my blood, my skin My body is this body is This body is where I live That's all it is bones, my blood, my skin, my body is, my body lives, my body gives, my body shifts, my body's gonna twist the script and flip the switch, my flesh and blood, my skin and bones, I said my flesh and blood, my skin and bones, here it goes, my flesh and blood, my skin and bones, head and shoulders, knees and toes, my flesh and blood, my skin and bones, my eyes and ears and mouth and nose, my flesh and blood, my skin and bones, head and shoulders, knees and toes, my eyes and ears and mouth and nose, my tits and ass and elbows, this body, it's my only home, won't you just leave it alone, my body is, my body is, my body just is, what? My body is, it's where I live. My body is, my body, my body, my body, my body is. My body is a tunnel. My body, it's a chain. My body is a road map. And my body is a stage. transition to the stage hand to sort out uh, the stage for the next performer. Hey.
So Devin mentioned that she was had just turned 40. So the next person coming to the stage just turned 80. That's like two Devons. <laughs> um, this next performer I've uh, known for almost 20 years. I met her in a comedy writing class. She hasn't written a thing since, but she keeps bugging me every week to try and write with her. <laughs> but I love her. She's billed as the only 80-year-old lesbian comic with a PhD, and she's doing her story that she's changed the title for many times. It was going to be called Birkenstocks to Barbie, but now it's called Continuing Studies on Transit. Is that right? <laughs> Close enough. Welcome to the stage, Mary Lee Stevenson. Yes, I am primarily a storyteller. I did take Janice's class. It ruined my confidence so badly. <laughs> I didn't think at 80, because I perform a lot, that I would all of a sudden feel totally stupid and incompetent. I blame her. <laughs> but I'm working on the stories and all that. And people say, like, where do you get your stories from? And I say, you want to get stories? go on transit. Right? <laughs> you don't have a problem. There will never be a, a lack. <laughs> like, not long ago, I'm on a bus, okay, and I'm sitting, you have to understand the context, I'm sitting this way, and there's a guy sitting next to me, and he's talking to a friend over there. And he's saying, I went home, she'd cleaned the place out totally, there was nothing left, no food, no nothing. I called her house, I called her mama. They got a restraining order on me. And I don't know, you know, like, um, we neither of us had a job, and we just had this one place. And, you know, I suppose that watching video games and having sex all the time doesn't just, maybe didn't work. And I thought to myself, I would have thought that was ideal. I don't know. I don't know what what he meant by that, um, but but so so that's how that's how that went. And, and he goes over to talk to the guy, explains everything, and says, and this is what you call a GBO, a blinding BGO, blinding glimpse of the obvious. He says to him, "I guess she wanted something different." <laughs> Yeah, this is really, you, know, you got the intellectuals there on the trips. <laughs> and I have to look at this because I am 80, and so I don't know what I'm going to say, but I write it down. And then if your skin, your skin wrinkles, of course. And then if you wash your hands at the bathroom, you lose your entire act. <laughs> so don't, don't shake hands out of the bathroom. Okay. Then there is, because there's a huge range of things, huge range of people, right? And there's, it's like, it's, you could be reading Dickens, you could be reading Margaret Atwood, you could be reading Alice Monroe. There's these themes, right? And you had the sex theme. There's one, Pride, We're on the bus, not hurting anybody. And you know, we have those buses that kneel. And so, we would stop somewhere and go, Pshh. this is the sound effects, I've trained for these, okay? Go, and a voice from outside, this very powerful woman's voice says, lift it up. And he kind of looking around the drive lane. And she says, lift it up. I don't need that. Because it was a matter of pride for her, you know? And so he goes, Psst, and up it goes again, you know? So that's your pride. I found out when somebody sitting next to me that she did that every time on every bus. <laughs> and then, you see, there are sad moments. Certainly there are sad moments. <laughs> That's the 14 bus, the Hastings bus is an entire sad moment. But, 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 so I was on the way, I was in, on the, the 20, which by the time it gets to the drive, is to lift the mood up a little bit. And there's a woman gets on, she's an older woman, and she has this big bag of kitty litter, and she's got the beginnings of a kitty uh, carpet thing, you know? And she's got little brushes and all of that, and she's hefting this stuff around and then puts it over there. People are staring at her, not unkindly, they're staring at her. And she looks at them, looking at her, and she said, I got a cat, my sister died, who else am I gonna talk to? <laughs> so you sit there going, oh, no lady, please. But yeah, so that's your sadness. And then, <laughs> and then, 
you can learn about yourself. You can be, I, I, I don't know if it shows, but I have this bad habit of, uh, condescending to people, I don't know how to say it. I think it's a sickness that goes, it doesn't just go with the PhD, I was born that way. And so, but anyway, I'm, uh, I live on the North Shore, so I'm going on this bus up the hill, up way the hell I'm gone, I just live near, but I have an accountant who tries to figure out how you make a low income look like it's an income, you know. And, um, and there's this young woman standing right next to the driver. And you know, they have that red line, right? It says, do not go ahead of that red line. And she's there and she's got her little backpack, her little carry front. She's leaning against there, very close to the driver, and she's talking, and she's talking, and she's talking. She has a high, penetrating voice, a woman probably 18, 20, and she knows everything about the bus. You know, she knows all their schedules. She knows all the drivers. She says, oh yeah, Jim likes that line, that's easier. Or so-and-so doesn't like that one because you know, it's harder on the brake. She has all that thing. And then it's her thing, right? And finally she gets off and I go, thank God. <laughs> and the next day I happen to be again trying to figure out the income um, up on the same bus and she is there again. And she is there leaning against that bus right over the red line and talking and talking and talking. And so then she gets off, and I, in my own supercilious way, I go up right close to the driver, over the red line actually, and I say, I thought people weren't supposed to go over the red line. <laughs> and she knows what I'm saying, and I know she knows. I'm saying, why don't you make her shut the fuck up? You know? <laughs> but she says to me, the driver, she says, it's okay if she talks, she's lonely. So you learn a little bit of that for that one. And then, just wrapping it up so Janice won't kill me later. Um, <laughs> it's how I one time became a story myself, right? I became a story. And I'm just thinking, I was on one of the large articulated buses. And I just, you know, they have all those for seniors courtesy things, but you know, it's moderately crowded. And I walk all the way just to the middle of it. I've never, I have a person here from the South, she'll understand. I always still like to sit in the back of the buses because white kids in Augusta, you couldn't sit in the back, so you thought it was very exotic, right? And so, because black people, you, you know, okay. So, I am 80, we're talking 70 years ago, not that it's improved a lot, I think, but in any case. So I'm sitting back there, and the bus doesn't move. So I didn't think one thing or the other. I think, well, there's probably going to be a, uh, you know, a, one of those ramps or something. Nothing happens. And then the driver says, they got microphones. He says, courtesy seats. And nothing else, nothing happens. And so then he says again, and I keep waiting for something to happen in the front. He says, courtesy seats, or this bus doesn't move. And I look and realize everybody that bus is looking at me, and I'm in the middle of this, and there, and, and everybody under 50 shoots up, you know, all these young guys, so that they can give me a seat. And so then, a uh, nice, but you know, who wants that kind of attention? And so I do sit down, and I was thinking later, well, you know. How did they sort of scream these people at the bit? What was it I get on there? And I think, well, Mary, you got gray hair, you got white hair, but, but I had on a hoodie. <laughs> so I had to realize it, it was my face. <laughs> so I don't know how you live with that. I'm working on it. But it, it, what I do from now on, or I do now, like, <laughs> if anybody under 50 doesn't shoot up, I say, it's International Women's Day all year long. Get the fuck up. I'm traveling. <laughs> Sorry.
about the transit. I mean, you know, like she says, if you need stories, just go ride the transit. There's, I mean, we've all got, if, if you dare to ride, you know you're. <laughs> all right, so our next performer, I was lucky enough to meet just in February. Um, we were doing a wellness conference together on a, a mental health panel at the um, big center there. We do, I took transit that day. <laughs> But uh, this person is a mama, and she's been a food coach for 20 plus years. And I'm very excited to have her on my stage because I really, we made such a connection and I really enjoy her, just her. So welcome to the stage, Simone Lavelle. <laughs> And tonight on International Women's Day, I want to talk about a role that many women play. A role that I feel is one of the most important roles in our lives, the role of mother. Many of you may be mothers, many of you may not be, many of you maybe want to be a mother one day and many of you may never want to be a mother. Whichever your choice, regardless of your personal status as a mother, everyone in this room and everyone in this world has a mother. It's a universal truth. And it's one that connects us all. And our mothers shape us. Our mothers shape us if we have a relationship with them. They shape us if we don't have a relationship with them. They shape us for the good and they shape us for the worse. And tonight I want to share with you, for the first time um, for me, a deeply personal story, the story of how my mother shaped me. Now an image, a typical image of a mother is usually one that is kind, loving, warm, one that lifts you up, builds you up, supports you, is nurturing and nourishing and loves you unconditionally. And I believe that every mother sets out to live up to this image, to this archetype. But we're all human, and life doesn't always work out that way. My mother was a strong, strong woman. She was strong because she had to be. Her and her parents survived so many hardships, a life I cannot even imagine, a life that brings me to tears even to think about. And her strength made her cold, distant, and hard. So hard. Hard on me, yes, but even harder on herself. My mother was a fit woman. She was in good shape. She had a healthy body, but she didn't recognize that. She was so hard on herself when it came to her body and her weight. But children, children are like sponges, and I saw it and I took it all in. Heck, I've been a nutritionist and a fitness coach for the last 25 years. Clearly, it had an impact on me. I, my mother introduced me to the concept of diet culture. I watched her struggle my entire life. I watched her harbor this deep hatred for her body. I watched her binge eat and then starve herself, starve herself and binge eat and binge it and starve herself and repeat the cycle day in and day out. I watched her punish herself for the food that she ate by going to the gym and having a hard workout. I watched her weigh herself every single day, sometimes multiple times a day. And there was this tape measure that lived on the bathroom counter and I watched her measure her waist, her hips, and her thighs every single day, hoping that the measurements would come down, the inches would come down, even though there weren't any inches left. My mother's relationship with her food and her weight and this obsession, it was, it was a reflection of a 
a deeper mental illness, one that she couldn't recognize, but I recognized it, I saw it. As a teenager and as a young adult, I saw it for what it was, and I swore to myself, I will be different. I will not follow in her footsteps. I will not fall into this trap that so many women do. I will love my body, I will nourish it, I will love it unconditionally. And I will not pass this on to the next generation and I will not pass this on to my daughter. And for a while there, I felt like I succeeded. I did love my body, I did nourish it. I did love it unconditionally. I didn't obsess over it until one day I did. When I got pregnant with my daughter, I gained 65 pounds, and I was racked with postpartum depression. It hit me like a tidal wave, and I was drowning under the water, not knowing which way was up and which way was down. But I had a daughter to take care of, I knew it. So I toughened up and I got strong. I also got distant, cold, and hard. And it was in this moment that I realized this is what my mother was fighting all those years. Her trauma and her depression led her to feeling the need that she had to be strong. Strong to protect herself, sure, but to protect me ultimately. To protect me from her, to protect me from her depression. And she got distant and cold because this was her way of being able to look after me. And that obsession with her weight and her food, that was just the only thing that she had control over in her life. The depression took everything. So tonight, my hope through sharing this personal story is that you can see the ripple effect when we don't love our bodies. And I beg you, to love the body you're in, even if it's not exactly how you want it to look. I beg you to appreciate every organ in your body, your lungs that breathe for you, your heart that beats for you, you don't even have to do anything, it keeps you alive. It's a beautiful thing. And I believe that when you love your body unconditionally, you won't abuse it. You will nourish it. You will take care of it. You'll move as a blessing. You will eat beautiful food because you love it so much. And I believe that when you love your body unconditionally, we can end this cycle, this negative cycle of diet culture, and we can prevent it from being passed on from generation to generation. So, I'd like to make a toast. Together, let's raise our glasses and cheers to us making a change. To being the bold ones, the rule breakers, the ones who say no to diet culture and yes to radical self-acceptance. We are the ones who will shake things up. We won't play by the usual standards. We will not be afraid to stand out. We will change the game. We will be the ones moving in the world to a place where everyone feels accepted and celebrated no matter their shape or size. Some might call us crazy, but we would know we are onto something big because we know if we dare to dream of a world without body judgment, we stand to make a real difference and end the cycle once and for all. never been so done on a stage before and we take that risk in our life and that was part of the reason I put the show together the way I did where I I know comedy is my genre and we've got other comics coming on 
But sometimes the stories we hear are the stories we need to hear. So for whatever reason, they all need to be brought to the stage. So, okay. And on that note, I wanted to um, tell you that my granddaughter yesterday said to me, Grandma, if you die in the shower, will you go to heaven naked? <laughs> and all I could think of is, how many murder mysteries is her mom watching? <laughs> you know, like she just like was just so authentic about it. She said, this is like a, a lovely little seven-year-old I love dearly, right? And she just comes up with these questions all the time. A couple years ago, when I went to pick her up at daycare, she said to me, you know, my kids, when they were little, we'd go to McDonald's, we'd take them to the ballroom, we'd have an ice cream cone, and everybody's happy. And she said to me, I said, do you want to go to McDonald's and get an ice cream cone? She said, no, Grandma, I'd like sushi. <laughs> I said, we're not going for sushi. She said, okay, then, let's just pick up a charcuterie board. <laughs> right because they just the things that they say are great but I don't know if any of you now are caught up in this um, I've got several of my friends who are older than me and then I've got some that still have their parents obviously who are older still and everybody's into this comparison stage you know where the the this generation is all like, oh, we used to get a cup of coffee for 25 cents. I don't know why you guys are rah, rah, rah. They're going on and on, beacon off, right? And then my, like the next generation, the one that's, you know, my, the boomers and stuff, they're like, I can't believe we used to pay $1.25 and we get free refills and that. <laughs> and my kids are like, I don't know what's wrong with you, Mom. $18 is a good deal for that coffee. And I'm like, yeah, but it didn't have flavor in it, right? <laughs> And I don't know what's coming for the future. Can you imagine that, right? Like three or four generations down where they're like, can you believe our parents used to buy things in a cup? <laughs> and they had to go there and pick it up. Why didn't they just take their chill pill coffee in the morning and they're good for the whole day? <laughs> Any of you old enough to remember the Jetsons? Yeah. Yay! Yeah. So I love that show when I grew up. I watched it all the time, and I am so pissed off at this age that I can't just put a jet pack on my back and just go and visit my friend in Niagara-on-the-Lake or wherever she is or another, you know, trail where I grew up and all this. Like, I think, why did that not happen? Why are we doing stupid things like sending one guy to the moon? Why don't we get all jet packs, right? Anyway, that's just a rant, so can we get on that? I'll just, like, I want to keep the show going, but I've got more, so. I want to bring your next comic to the stage. Uh, she is a two-faced Gemini, according to her. I don't know what's coming here. Um, but she's excited to be here, and she's excited to stay. Oh, she's a serious businesswoman by day, by, by day, and obviously by night, <laughs> something else. So welcome to the stage, Ann Ho. stories. Uh, I just want you to know how I'm doing today. <laughs> I'm a crampy girl. I'm a crampy world. My uterus is magic. It's fantastic because it's free housing. <laughs> uh, yep, I'm, I'm a woman. Uh, specifically, a woman of color. Yellow. Uh, I'm Vietnamese. Um, you would have found out if you checked my tag. Uh, okay. So do you know how uh, the 
despite a lot of scholarships and marketing, uh, there's still not many women in STEM and science. Um, we're so busy listening to true crime podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> it's way more probable that I would die by a man than climate change. <laughs> 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 Why do I need to know how to make a refrigerator out of rubber bands? <laughs> do you know that's possible? Uh, yeah, it is. Um, when I know to just walk naturally faster if I sense there's a man behind me, <laughs> that's a way more useful skill to have. <laughs> world um, because I can't be creepy. <laughs> If you were a Vietnamese woman traveling to Singapore alone, they would immediately put you back on the plane right back home. Because they don't like potential prostitutes. But they don't know our real talents are the nails. <laughs> before um, COVID, uh, I went to the US for the second time after six months of paperwork, thousands of dollars, lots of trips back and forth to the embassy. I got the visitor visa and upon arrival, I got put in a tiny detention room with an angry, big, white male border officer. Uh, he aggressively went through all of my belongings, including my private journals. Uh, while he was interrogating me, accusing me of lying, and threatened to send me back home. And he wouldn't let me go until I told him that my partner at the time, a um, male partner, was waiting for me on the other side. What a dick. <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to tell you so that we can suffer together. <laughs> I went through all of that alone. Nobody was there. Uh, what else? Oh yeah, uh, being a woman, uh, hormones, wrinkles, not enough pockets. <laughs> it's great, it's great being a woman. Uh, in Asia, um, Southeast Asia, where I'm from, uh, if I'm with a white male partner, everybody would either think that my partner is has a yellow fever, uh, or that I am a gold digger, uh, which is great because at least they think I'm rich. <laughs> so. Uh, but here in the West is great because um, I always get picked uh, for the diversity hire. <laughs> and that's why I'm here today. <laughs> so if you are a woman of any color, I don't discriminate unless you're transparent. Uh, <laughs> uh, please uh, tell me your fucked up stories of being a woman. I'd love to, I'd love to hear. Uh, yeah.
We have a real treat here tonight. We have another singer that's going to come on. I'm sorry, I need these things now, whatever the hard they work. <laughs> um, she's from Memphis, and she's a proud black American woman with some indigenous heritage. And I was lucky to meet her and Samaya, who's sitting over there, and Paul, actually, uh, when we did our TEDx talks for SFU last year. So we uh, spent a lot of time locked in a boardroom, <laughs> right? No, we were coached and uh, met every two weeks or whatever, so we shared a lot of internal stories and laughs and just goings on and carrying on, but we really had a wonderful time together, and I'm so excited to have her on the show. Welcome to the stage, Chiara Cash. <laughs> Thanks, y'all, for being here. I'm excited. Um, so yes, I'm Tiara, as mentioned, and I am that lovely woman Marianne was talking about from Memphis. I've um, been singing basically all of my life, so excited to share a song here with you. Um, I'm also a scholar, uh, author. I have some books back there, children's books, so if you know any kiddos and you're looking to give some books, there are some back there. Um, yeah, and have lots of experience in different genres, including <coughs> classical music with operas, um, singing gospel in churches. Um, of course, you know, I'm from Memphis, so blues, rock and roll, all types of good stuff. So tonight I'm gonna sing um, a cover. It's called Chariot by Gavin DeGraw. And it's about the sun, because we need more sun. <laughs> <laughs>
Tierra. All right. Your next comic to the stage, actually, I met when I was producing BC's Funniest New Female competition. And she just showed up for the show and had a spot on it and was one of the finalists. That's how good she is. So I'd like you to welcome to the stage Eden Kaminsky. National Women's Day, everyone. <laughs> really excited to be here. I always like to start off my sets with this truth of mine. This is a practice voice. This is the reality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I smoke a lot of cigarettes. It's, it's the doctors are really concerned. I don't know. Uh, no, I am a trans woman. That's uh, something about my identity, and I do. Uh, vocal feminization therapy, so I practice to have a feminine voice. It's l a lot of hard work over the last three years, severely undercutted by the fact that the women I date like my voice deeper. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly don't know what to do with that. It's, uh, I found it dumbfounding, but I, I, I figured I might as well steer into the skate a little bit, so I now end my dates being like, I really like you. Uh, I actually have a secret. You want to come here? I'm not wearing any underwear. <laughs> it's an absolute killer. It's uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, voice drops are very situational. I'm, I've noticed, like on stage, I'm funny. Uh, on dates with women, I'm sexy. On dates with men, I'm murdered. <laughs> yeah, that's the reality, folks. It's pretty sad. It's uh, yeah. Um, I, I honestly, it's got. It got me worried to a point where, because you know, like there there are states and areas in the world where guys can go and date, like hook up with a trans woman and then murder them, and then in court they could be like, I have to defend myself. I didn't want to get turned gay, and yeah, that's a, that's an actual defense that has worked. And with that in, that that being the fact of the world, that's why I only meet guys through Grinder. <laughs> I need that paper trail there, you know, like, I want to see them do that, uh, that thing and just have that profile there, just being like, is that you, sir? And it's like, yeah, but, you know, it's trickery. Ah. <laughs> no, uh, but yeah, I'm trans. That's something about me. Um, I hated coming out as Eden uh, when I first, like, started my transition because I didn't look like an Eden, so people thought they misheard me. Oh, hey, Evan, what's up, bro? Oh. Well, it's actually Eden like the garden. Okay, okay. Eden, you just gotta be confident, man. Because otherwise people just won't respect you. Yeah, I got told that. But you know, there was a little hope with there with Eden like the garden, which is strange, because that's the only time the Bible's ever helped out. <laughs> Very strange. But no, it's... We're trying to people to pick our own names. That's something unique about us. You know, with varying results, like I'm Eden like the garden, and I once met someone named Shu. I had sex with Shu. <laughs> yeah, that's not something you want to tell your ex, but that's, that's a reality. I really like Shu. Like, we connected immediately, and it was no surprise. They were just my type. A goody two-shoes. <laughs> Shu was also uh, polyamorous, uh, and they had a partner. Shu, being polyamorous, I got and I also kind of got with them having a partner, because after all, I spent a mile on their partner's shoe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, honestly, shoe loves the puns. I, <laughs> I'm glad you guys like it as well. It's, I was fascinated with that name choice, you know, because names to me are like tattoos, you know, like, they're permanent, and they have to have a meaning behind them. So I was like, shoe, are you a shoemaker? <laughs> No, oh, that's a good guess, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they were like, no, my name used to be Joshua. And I was looking at that Joe and then Shu. And I was like, Shu, that's me. <laughs> and that pissed me off. <laughs> to my core. Because that's how I got my name. Because <laughs> my name isn't Eden like the garden. My name used to be Braden. B R A Bra, E D E N. Take off the bra, and now you got Eden. <laughs> and I put on a bra before coming here, so it's a whole cycle. <laughs> oh, it's... I had a, my full dead 
name used to be Braden Peter Ben Kaminsky. And you know, when you change your uh, whole name, you have to change you know, the middle name as well. And I like that that PB was sandwiched in the middle of it. So I thought peanut butter would be a good middle name. <laughs> you know, it's fun, it's wholesome. I'm trying to make a career in show business. People are more likely to buy things with peanut butter in it. <laughs> and, and it had the brilliant legal disclaimer built in. Warning, it contains nuts. <laughs> It has it all, folks. It's absolutely love that. It's, uh, but no, it was dicey, you know, when I started my transition because I didn't know if I was going to look feminine or not. You know, that, that's a fact about when anyone starts their transition. They don't know how well it's going to turn out. And I'm like, four years in now, I'm feeling really good about myself and my appearance, but I have a new problem. I look like my mother. <laughs> That is a horrible woman, a horrible feeling to have as a woman. Just looking in the mirror and you see your mother. It's just all this disappointment. But I love my mother. I do. It's just dicey because I can see her in a new light and I can see myself in uh, in her. And I've never never pictured my mom as a lesbian stoner. <laughs> no, she's a good Christian woman. That's uh, not see that coming. No, but it's weird to go from one gender binary to the other because standards slip on you. Three inches is cute for a penis, but monsters for a clit. <laughs> yeah. I'm a comic, I'm dirty. That's uh, how I roll. <laughs> I actually, that's one of my favorite jokes to tell to audiences because it's very revealing. Because sometimes when I see couples in the audience, and the girl laughs a little too hard. <laughs> Not from like appreciating the joke, but from, from experience. <laughs> it's the best thing in the world. So. Although it's a little dangerous sometimes when I tell that joke because some, okay, this happened to me once when I told the joke. Uh, I said the joke and then a girl stood up and be like, he has a two inch penis pointing at her boyfriend. Oh. Yeah, fellas, you feel lucky with your girls right now? <laughs> Thank you, Jane, for laughing at that. The guys did not like it. Uh, but the guy, he, he was so confident. He took it on the chin and be like, yeah, I got a two-inch dick and a big truck. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> I'm like, sir, the size of the, your balls right now are huge. It almost makes up for your tiny penis. It's <laughs> almost. <laughs> Family's weird for me, you know, it's, it, you know, like, it, it shouldn't be shocking because like my granddad, he understands that I'm a trans woman, but doesn't accept it. But it's not shocking for me because this was his advice to me in high school. Brayden, you gotta watch out for these homosexuals. <laughs> They're gonna try to get ya. <laughs> And he didn't warn me about the transsexual, so here we are. <laughs> it's a horrible piece of advice. Uh, but he's, he's getting older now. And he, okay, here's something that my mom hates me telling on stage, but this is what happened last year. He texted me asking for a kidney. And I left him on red. Because <laughs> what do you want to reply to that? Besides, yes, I'll give you my kidney. It's, it's I don't know. I, I, I didn't want to make it say, uh, say no and make it more awkward. And this year he had a near death experience. And I'm like kind of thinking about my whole relationship with him. And I'd be like, maybe I should just finally go to him. Like, hey, granddad, I think I'm ready to give you that kidney. <laughs> But you have to know the reason why I was hesitant in the first place is there's a 5% chance you might become trans. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to watch him sweat a little bit. You know? <laughs> How badly do you want to live? Let's find out. Let's... <laughs> uh, honestly, that would make a good, like, Adam Sandler movie. You know? <laughs> write the script, I'll send it to him, we'll see if this happens. <laughs> also, I don't think it's going to be a big change for him anyways, you know, because he already has tits. <laughs> I think he'll be a graceful woman. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, 
this, through this whole gender journey, I think I understand gender quite well. You know, like I know the difference between men and, and women. A lot, of people, a lot of people like to say it's like fire and an ice. I don't think it's like that at all. I think it's more like ice to water. Because I went from being hard to being wet. <laughs> yeah, quite the wardrobe change right there. It's uh, caught me off guard. Uh, but I got some bad news this week. I, got, I, I did an STI result test. Yeah, came back positive for athlete's foot. Oh. Never trust a shoe. <laughs> and that's that time I didn't see the It's about lights, not these in this, well, I'm used to these. I keep getting a memo from my strata about my take down your Christmas lights bullshit, right? I'm like, these are not my Christmas lights. The first memo came in February, I said they're my Valentine's lights, deal with it. And then I just got another one today and I said, I just put up my Easter lights early, deal with it. But here's my thing that I really need the rants about. Marketing. Why don't fucking lights market, them, market themselves as lights? Right? Because then you got all those lights for all those seasons. Like, I'm going to have them on in the summer, too. They're going to have to deal with it. They're going to be summer lights. Right? So just call them lights. But we get that every year. Christmas. Go get your Christmas light. You're like, say, okay, that's one, one rant. <laughs> The other one is dead people on Facebook. <laughs> How do we get them off? <laughs> right? Can't they, they, can't they get a whole new section, call it face plant or something like that? And they just, you know, when they put the memorial page up, they automatically, woo, you know, go over to the face plant, plant division. Like, I, like, it freaks me out when I get a birthday message, like, you know, good, happy, heavenly birthday. I'm like, they're not up there, probably, and they don't know that you're putting this on Facebook. Like, right? I like you two. It's my last rant for the evening. I'm going to bring up your next comic. I've done tons of shows with her. She's a wonderful Vancouver-based Ojibwe comedian. She's got some unique jokes, and I think she's bringing some cheekiness to the stage tonight. Give it up for Brenda Prince. Thank you, Jan. Um, I am from Winnipeg. Uh, Winnipeg is an Ojibwe word that means muddy waters because natives really love the blues. <laughs> McLean's Magazine once proclaimed Winnipeg as the most racist city in Canada, which sounds terrible, but if you're from Winnipeg, you're like, yay, we're finally number one at something. <laughs> so um, I met my partner on the indigenous dating app, Buckskins. <laughs> and um, his opening line was, you want to come back to my teepee and we'll make some smoke signals? <laughs> and I thought, okay, that sounds kind of cheesy, but you know, he's kind of cute. So I replied, yeah, okay, but only if you promise to butter my bannock. <laughs> and I, I think he used love medicine on me. Like indigenous people have like indigenous love potions. Um, we have this ancient love potion. You might know it as lemon gin. <laughs> and we call that anti-panty remover. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Uh, me and my partner have been, like, we just celebrated our 26th anniversary last week. Uh, but you, you really don't need to applaud because, like, he is my partner. He's not my husband. And partner just sounds more polite than the pet name I call him at home, which is that lazy son of a bitch who won't propose. <laughs> but, uh, but I don't blame him, right? Like, when, when we met. 
but with that, right? Like I was a single mom with kids and grandchildren, and now I'm 60. And um, in my defense, um, indigenous people do look young for their age, right? Like, have you heard that saying, black don't crack, or Asian don't raise them? <laughs> well, indigenous don't age it -ness. <laughs> Well, um, okay, sometimes uh, like we go on a, a couple's retreat. Like, um, I sleep in the bedroom and I make him retreat to the couch. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, at this point in our relationship, our um, romantic getaways um, consist of getting the hell away from each other. <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. But we, we are like um, an old married couple, like, um, we put up with each other's eccentricities, right? So, like, he likes a hot room, like, sleep in a hot room, like, as hot as a sweat lodge. And, uh, and then I like a cold room, right? Like, as cold as an igloo. Um, which, by the way, that's what he calls my vagina. <laughs> and I'm like, first of all, racist. And, and then I said, second of all, um, it's not my fault that you turn my uh, little easy bake oven into a cold storage box. <laughs> um, when we do talk, like we finish each other's sentences, like not correctly, but we do finish each other's sentences. Like, like just the other day, like I was saying, like, oh, well, I can't wait for it to be spring when everything blooms and turns green. And um, he's like, yeah, you're right, Brenda. We should order the extra large KFC family bucket <laughs> with extra fries. And I'm, and I'm like, what does that have to do with everything blooming in, in spring? And, and he's like, 11 herbs and spices. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, so we've been together a long time. So and, um, <laughs> um, have you um, ever had a, an Indian affair? <laughs> Like, we've had so many Indian affairs that there's an entire branch of government dedicated to them. <laughs> it's called Indian Affairs. Well, um, well um, you know, they changed the name, right? Because, you know, um, Indian affair, like Indian, like the Indians got mad and then some Canadians got mad. So they changed it to Indigenous Affairs. <laughs> and then we had a lot of Indigenous Affairs and then, um, <laughs> We had, so many. we had to change the name again, and we changed it to Indigenous Services, which, in my opinion, sounds worse, because now it just sounds like an escort agency. <laughs> well, uh, well, I'd like to order some Indigenous Services. <laughs> so, like, we have different names for um, sexual positions. Like, you have, uh, like, 69, and we have under the O69. <laughs> well, let me explain. <laughs> because, you know, like Native people just love bingo, right? So um, we love it so much um, that when we orgasm, like we're not going like, oh God, or, or great. Like we just yell out, bingo! <laughs> and then um, also, um, like, even our indigenous lesbians have their position, right? Um, like, uh, it's called, like, you have scissoring, and we got fabric scissoring, <laughs> which is just the same as scissoring, but you leave your jeans on. <laughs> and then <laughs> you have, like, um, the helicopter, and uh, we have the rotating beaver. <laughs> Which is, I gotta learn that, because maybe he'll put a ring on it if I have, you know, um, can do the rotating beaver. And then, um, have you heard that saying, um, black don't crack? Oh, no, no, wait. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, no, oh. Once you tried black, you don't go back? Yeah. Well, uh, well, we have uh, this saying, it's called, like, once you go traditional, you get erect nipples, yo. <laughs> but, okay, yeah, I, I am from Winnipeg. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Okay, so when I was growing up in the 60s, we started school at 9 a.m. and then uh, we had to sing O Canada, followed by God Save the Queen, and then we got to sit down in our chair and listen to the teacher read from the Bible for five minutes. And the Bible reading was my favorite part because that's where I really learned stuff, like um, creative writing, <laughs> and then how to meditate, you know. Like, I, I, as a kid, I wanted to be a white kid, right? And I'd, I'd be like, 
Oh, why do white people all look the same? Oh, why can't I be a white person too? Oh, and if I was a white person, how do I make that face when there's no gluten-free breadsticks? <laughs> <laughs> no, can, I can't imagine being like a white kid, but can you imagine I'd be like, hello, mother, I'd like to take clarinet lessons. <laughs> and then, like, I do white people stuff, like open up a savings account. <laughs> and I'd be like, ooh, baloney, gross. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was just in No Frills, and um, they have this, uh, Heinz has this new product called Mayo Chup. Like, it's half mayonnaise and half ketchup. Mayo chup. But unfortunately, in the Cree language, mayo chup translates to shit face. <laughs> but, but it's all good, it's all good because, um, you know, like when the Crees come home from the bar on mayo chup <laughs> and they fry up their bologna, like they can smear mayo chup on it and you know, maybe throw up mayo chup on it. Heinz has reported that sales of mayo chup have increased in Cree country, which begs the question. How much mayo chop can a Cree mayo chop if a mayo chop Cree can chop mayo? Oh, okay. 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 your plugs going and everything. So how have you enjoyed the show so far? So my goal again in producing it was to bring a little bit of everything to the show that was all based on International Women's Day, if we want to call that. I am hugely biased because I agree with, I think, one of the other speakers said it, which should be every day. Um, right. I, like I say, I've been on many, many comedy shows, many, many, but this tends to be guy, 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 guy. Okay, Janice, you can do a spot, you know. <laughs> so um, hang in there, you know, we need more of these, and if you'd like to see some more, let me know. I have a little table at the back there where I'll put my cards and stuff, and if you're interested in stand-up comedy classes, I teach here downstairs in the club, and you can come <laughs> take a class, be on the stage maybe next time. Um, and maybe I'll just do an all-female class. That'd be fun. You know, I'll tell you something. When I started teaching comedy classes, I had 14 dudes with their hats on backwards, their pants falling down, and all they wanted to talk about was their dicks. <laughs> 20 years forward, my current class in there is uh, 16 women and two dudes. Yeah. So we're doing it. Um, are you ready there? Yes. Give it up for Devin Moore. Yes, thank you. I've missed you. It's so nice to be back. My name is still Devin Moore, and you can congratulate me. Yes, I'll wait. I'll wait. Thank you. Yes, uh, congratulate me. I went through a breakup. Kind of was Like the relationship is not serving me in any way, but I am a middle child with abandonment issues and a people pleaser with a deeply anxious attachment style and I had to be the one to like. <laughs> I can't even say it on stage. I had to do it. I had to do the breakup and I did it. So big deal. And then, uh, thank you. Yes, after I did it, I was devastated. Because only after I got out of the relationship did I realize that my soulmate was this man's dog. <laughs> this man's dog, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it took me 18 months to notice. Like, that relationship was just me and the dog, and then this emotionally unavailable man that followed us around everywhere. It was <laughs> so weird. <laughs> And so then, then you know, that's that's hard to know. And so then I went through this phase where I just like everywhere I was like dogs, dogs, dogs. Oh, there's you've dog, oh dogs. Oh. I live in Vancouver. There's dogs everywhere, right? Dogs. Oh, you've got it. Oh, look at your cute dog. Oh, you just rescued a dog. Dog, dog. I just want a dog. I want a puppy. I just want give me a pup. Just give me a puppy. I'll eat it. You know. <laughs> dog fever. 
made me feel like a woman. I was like, oh, this is that biological clock ticking thing. <laughs> Except for with dogs instead. And uh, if you do have baby fever, it's like you need at least one other person or like some sort of bureaucratic process to like deal with, scratch that itch, you know? Uh, if you have dog fever, you can just sort that out like almost instantly if you're an adult. Like they will just give you basically a dog. <laughs> it's incredible. This is an epiphany for me, people. Do you know how much time and energy I spent in my adult life chasing after emotionally unavailable men when what I really wanted was just an emotional support animal. <laughs> like I knew, I knew, I, I know myself. I knew I needed like the warm furry body in the bed, but I was just, I was way off. I was looking at the completely wrong species. <laughs> and then if you, if you do get a dog and if you have been to your GP with as long a laundry list of mental health concerns over the years as I have, then your doctor will write you a note and you, the note will say, Devin, needs to have an emotional support animal. These are my limitations, I'm accept accepting them. Uh, and then you take that note and you show it to the dog and you're like, it's, you're it. <laughs> she didn't apply for the position. <laughs> This bitch has no training or qualifications, and I'm like, we're just putting you in charge of supporting all my emotions. I'm an artist, it's a lot. It's a lot of emotions. Uh, and now that I have a dog, I realize that I really could not have been a dog owner while I was still vegan. <laughs> there, it's, it's a disease. Oh. There it is again. Because uh, now it's like I, I, I want to protect myself and my home, and so whatever I can throw at laser tooth, like what do we got? Marrow bones, pig's ears, chicken feet, hooves, water buffalo horns. These this is not jokes. This is just what I throw at the animal that lives in my ho home to keep her from like attacking me. Beef, beef pizzle, bully sticks, yeah. Dog owners in the house? Bully sticks, yeah, that's what they say the ingredients are, beef pizzle. She loves them, she destroys them in minutes. They're supposed to last days. Anyway, we're like a whole animal. We went from no animal household and now we eat the whole animal all the time. And it's working wonders for the rest of my relationships, I will say that, um, because I, I set boundaries now. Yay! Yeah, because I, I, ha like I had to live under the threat of a wild animal potentially killing me in my sleep if I don't maintain my boundaries consistently. And now I do, so it's great. So much you can learn from an emotional support animal, and I don't want any, I don't want, I made some jokes here about emotionally unavailable men, and I don't want any of the men in this crowd to feel targeted. I shouldn't, I shouldn't resort to that kind of language. I should call them emotionally unavailable victims of the patriarchy. Because <laughs> that's what they are, you are, I'm sorry. We all suffer under patriarchy. And it is that male-ish slice of the gender spectrum, it is our culture's greatest tragedy to you that we do not encourage you to fully explore, acknowledge, communicate the depth of all your feelings and your vulnerability and your emotion. It's terrible, I'm sorry for you. That's how we bond as people. And you're not acculturated to do that at all. I don't know why you're not more mad about the patriarchy, to be honest, boys. <laughs> yeah, you should be, like, I know that's your one emotion, like, you should be really mad <laughs> at the patriarchy. That you don't have other feelings about it. Like, sure, okay. Like, we have to go out and protest every now and then, women, because, you know, we get, like, raped and underpaid. But men, you don't get to have friends. <laughs> That's worse. Or hugs. Yeah. It's like, pockets will only get you so far. I, uh, I invite you, I invite everyone in this room, just for the sake of this last song, to buy into the sort of, like, warm, cozy, divine collective feminine energy and self-identify, if you will, as a, a beautiful bitch. Um, for the duration of the song and beyond, if, if it suits you, come on over. My high 
highest honor, my proudest privilege, spilling the sacred tears with you, beautiful bitches. My deepest desire, my wildest wishes, lighting the friendly fires with you, beautiful bitches. You'll learn the chorus. Here it goes. My